Well, if you have your copy of the scripture, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. We are going to be in the ninth chapter this morning, verses 23 through 27. It has been observed that the New Testament is a book about disciples, by disciples, and for disciples. Now, I don't want you to take that statement as meaning that the central character of the scriptures is anyone other than Jesus Christ. That is not true. Jesus is the central figure in all of scripture. However, the purpose of the scriptures is to glorify him by showing us him and by making us his disciples. This is how we learn about him, what he expects of us, how we are to follow him, how we are to find redemption in him. But in our modern Western culture, we can sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that discipleship merely consists of reading about Jesus and accumulating some knowledge about him. But that is not all that there is to discipleship. We certainly should read the scriptures. We certainly should study them and dig in, and we should learn more and more about our Lord Jesus. However, we are to take that knowledge that we have accumulated and put it into action in our daily lives. That's what discipleship is. If you think about discipleship in the time of Jesus, I think we get a better picture of what what we are supposed to do. You see, a disciple in Jesus' time would literally follow that rabbi, that teacher. They would go where he went. They would sleep where he slept. They would follow him all the time, everywhere, and in every way. And the reason for that was not just so that they could hear his teaching. That was part of it. But they wanted to observe his living. They wanted to be so close to him that they could see how it was that he lived his life, how he carried on when the pressures came in on him. They wanted to see how he responded and then they wanted to imitate it. That was what being a disciple is about. And so we are inclined in our time to think of discipleship like a classroom but in Jesus' time, discipleship was like an apprenticeship. You were following to become just like the one you were following. And so when we read through the New Testament, that's the model that we see on display. We see Jesus literally inviting people to come after him, to follow him wherever he goes. We see his instructions on what discipleship truly means. We read about how his disciples took what they saw and learned from Jesus and in Jesus and then took it to the ends of the earth, making other disciples who would do the same things. And as we observe and as we read about all of this, we also discover what the cost of that discipleship is. You see, this discipleship of Jesus carries a cost. And if Luke's purpose is to tell us the truth about who Jesus is, and it was, that's what he says at the very outset of this book, then this cost should not be something that he would attempt to keep hidden. He would put it out there in full disclosure because Jesus did not keep this hidden. Jesus spoke about what the cost of following him would be, and that is what we see in our passage this morning. So if you are able, I ask you to stand in the honor of reading God's word this morning, where the beloved physician Luke writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels." 
But I tell you this truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Father, thank you so much for your word. As we come to this part of our worship of you this morning, I pray that your spirit would use it to sanctify us, to show us more what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that your spirit would empower us to go out from this place applying these words in our lives so that we might be better stewards of the grace that you have given to us in, in Jesus. For it's in his name and for his glory that we ask these things. Amen. Well, in the previous passage that we studied last week, Jesus was with his disciples, those who were his closest followers. And when the crowds came to see Jesus, they certainly wanted to hear his teaching. They wanted to feel his healing touch. But then they went back to their homes. They were not disciples. They were the crowds. But these 12 went with him wherever he traveled. And it was in the context of those closest followers of Jesus that we saw last week, Jesus asking that all-important question, the most important question that has ever been asked, who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? It was in that moment that Peter gave the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But now it appears in our passage that he has returned to the crowd because he says that he is addressing them all in verse 23. And what he's doing is he's showing them the essence of true discipleship. He's showing them what it means to be a disciple of his. And he begins by issuing an invitation. It's an invitation that he gives to those who are listening to him to follow him. Now, if you have ever heard very many sermons, you probably have not heard too many where the invitation comes at the beginning. But that is exactly what's happening here. Jesus invites people to come and to follow him and to take up their cross daily. That's what he's, he's doing here. And, and the apostle Peter, I think, may have been thinking of these very words when he wrote in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. Jesus gives an invitation to all to come and follow him. Our Lord is gracious. Let us never think that the Lord takes joy in destroying anyone. He does not. His word says that. But we know that his mercy is great, but we also know his justice is great as well. Because you see, every person has sinned. Every person has broken their relationship with God and has made themselves his enemy. That's what the word says. We, we can't get around that. We must not soften it. But we also know that his word tells us that in his grace and his love and his mercy, he sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our sin so that we might be reconciled to the Father. That is John 3.16, is it not? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The beauty of the gospel there. So having given this invitation, Jesus then explains what it means to follow him. What does that entail? Because, listen, to follow Jesus is more than just giving an intellectual assent. To him. It is more than just saying, yes, there was a man in Palestine in the first century AD named Jesus, who was a great teacher and who was crucified. It's more than that. You see, discipleship has a cost. Following Jesus is not a casual relationship. Where, where we follow him when it's convenient for us or, or when we find ourselves in a pickle and we really need somebody to help us out. And so we just reach out to the man upstairs to give us a little nudge and a little helping hand. That's not discipleship. That is not following Jesus because to be a disciple of Jesus requires a total commitment 
on the part of the person. It's in every aspect of our lives. Listen, when we come to Christ as a disciple, we don't surrender one-tenth. We don't even surrender nine-tenths of our lives. We surrender all. We give all. We surrender it to the one who gave all to pay for our sins and to offer us eternal life. And listen, this idea of surrendering every aspect of our life, it is not the domain of the super spiritual. It is not the domain of martyrs who give their lives for Christ. It is the expectation for every single believer. That's you That's me. We don't get to carve out areas of our life that we say, Jesus, you can have all of this, but but not this area. This area, I'm going to keep for myself. This area is going to be mine. No. It all goes to Jesus. And it's not optional. And Jesus explains what this total commitment looks like with three dimensions of discipleship. And the first one that he shows us is that we must practice self-denial. Now, there is a sense in which many have thought of this as the believer's reluctance or rejection of the luxuries of this life, that we are to be like the person on a diet who when the dessert cart comes by the table, we just say, oh, no, No, I'm denying myself that chocolate cake. That is, that's, that's not it. That's not what Jesus is telling us here. It's certainly true that the believers should not be laying up treasures in this world because rust and rot will destroy them. And we should never put our trust in those things of this world because they are temporary and they are passing away and they will be gone. Okay? But what Jesus is calling for here is so much more radical, and it's especially radical in our day. When he says that we are to deny ourselves, he is saying that we are to abandon our senses of personal autonomy. We are to take ourselves off the thrones of our lives and put him there. We no longer call the shots. We no longer get to be the ones who say what we're going to do. It is a rejection of all of our sinful desires, and it's a refusal to allow anything in this world or in our lives to interfere with our service to God. You might say it's being sold out on fire. We use a lot of terminology today to describe it, but what it means is we deny the self. And do you see how radical that is in our world today? Because the world says, to thy own self be true. And Jesus says, deny your own self. To me be true. You see, the self will lie. The self comes up with all kinds of misconceptions and imitations and counterfeits to the truth. It is for that reason that the great Genevan reformer John Calvin once said that self-denial is the sum of the Christian life. You can sum up what it means to live for Jesus with those two words, self-denial. I think he's right. Because if we're truly to be his disciples, we must be prepared to renounce everything in this world that would interfere with our allegiance to Christ. That means possessions, that means power, that means prestige, anything. And if we take this command seriously, and it is a command of Jesus, then we are better situated to understand the second dimension of true discipleship. When Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily. You know, the symbol of the cross has long been central to Christianity. In fact, I think you would be hard-pressed to find a Christian home that did not have a cross somewhere in it. 
You yourselves might wear jewelry that has the cross. I mean, we have a beautiful oak cross right up here. It's nice and polished. It's smooth. It's pretty. And it's not at all historically representative of what the cross was on which Jesus hung. I don't want to step on your toes on this. I'm not saying that you shouldn't wear a cross necklace or have a cross in your home or anything like that. I'm just saying if we're going to have those, let's be realistic about what they are. And, and, and let's, let's not take the sanitized, polished version as a replacement for what Jesus endured. You see, the cross was an implement of the most cruel form of execution that's ever been devised by humans. And so when Jesus said this, take up your cross, the people that heard him in the first century would have immediately pictured that cursed tree that embodied the cruelest and most awful oppression of the Romans and the most excruciatingly painful death that anyone has ever endured in a capital uh, sense. The cross was so vile, so awful, that the Romans who invented it would not even speak of it in polite company. They would not talk about this. Roman citizens would not be crucified on a cross. It was so awful. It was reserved for the outcasts. And so when, when Jesus says we are to take up our cross daily, the people who were listening to him here would have immediately imagined, because they would have witnessed this, they would have imagined that person who took up that crossbar and put it up on their shoulders and carried it under Roman guard to the place where they would be hoisted up with it onto that vertical pole and hung there until they died, sometimes taking days upon days upon days. And so this would have been a one-way journey. It was not a journey that you come back from. It had only one outcome death. And so Jesus takes that command to deny ourselves and he goes even further. He says we're to crucify every aspect of our desires that are self-centered. We're to be killing it. And sometimes we think of dealing with a troublesome time as, well, that's just my cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is saying here. In the context of our passage, it doesn't mean the regular troubles that we endure from living in a world marred by sin. He's talking about how we crucify the flesh and its desires every day and we seek to live for Christ with total commitment. And when we do, we will face hardships on his account. For his name, we will endure these things. Listen, if you live a life of total commitment for Christ today, you will be ostracized in this world. If you don't think this world will look at you like a weirdo because you live for Christ, then you haven't lived for Christ. If you don't think the world is going to reject you just as it rejected him, of course it will. It may even mean losing your livelihood it may mean losing your friends or your family or even your freedom. It might even mean losing your life. Because being a disciple of Jesus means being willing to follow him all the way to the hill of Calvary. And that kind of following is the third aspect of discipleship that Jesus presents here. And I hope it's clear now that when Jesus says, follow me, he means that we are to take the same path of self-denial and self-sacrifice that he did. Jesus, who was fully God, willingly stepped out of eternity and condescended to take on flesh, becoming like you and like me in every way except for sin. He lived a life 
in which he endured every temptation that you and I face, except he endured it in full and overcame it. And then because he did that, because he could live a life that was in perfect obedience to God's law, he alone was the only one worthy to be the lamb that would take away the sin of the world and would go to the cross and die in our place so that we might have life full and free. And he willingly laid down his life, even though he could have called myriad upon myriads of angels to come out of heaven and remove him from the cross and wipe out the entire Roman Empire in a snap. He did not do that. He paid the price in full so that he might redeem all who would come to him in faith and follow him. And as a result, he was rejected by this world. He was rejected by those whom he came to save. He faced suffering. He faced death. And he calls his disciples to follow that same road. So brothers and sisters, and listen, I am speaking specifically to all of you who call yourselves a Christian this morning. I have to ask, are you following Christ on this road? Are you following him Listen, when we're faithful to his commands and we live lives of humble faithfulness that are empowered by his grace, and listen, that's the only way you can do this. You can't do this by your own power. It is only in the power of the grace of God Then you will endure ridicule and rejection. When you deny yourself and you live lives of purity in regards to your sexuality, in regards to your ethics, in regards to your language, in regards to your fleshly desires, when you deny those things, you will face persecution. But take heart, Christian. Christ traveled that road already, and he overcame. And not only did he overcome in victory, he gives us that victory when we follow him. And so we shouldn't be surprised that this creates a seeming paradox. There's a paradox here. There's a tension between what we expect to be true and what is actually true. And Jesus lays out that paradox in verse 24. Look at that with me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In that statement, we see a contrast between the world's advice and Jesus' promise. The world's advice would tell us that our best bet is to make sure we are looking out for number one because nobody else will. You, it, listen, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, isn't it? I mean, people are just climbing all over. We call it the rat race. People are climbing all over each other. They're trying to stab each other in the back. If you work in the secular world, you may have experienced that. People trying to gun for your position or take you out so that they can have what you have, make sure you don't get too high. You know this. You've been there. And so the world tells you you need to fight for yourself. You need to put yourself first. And you need to make sure you're climbing the corporate ladder and advancing in your position and increasing your earnings and amassing more and more possessions because someone else will get ahead of you. And at the end of the day, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? No, he who dies with the most toys still dies. And none of them get to go with them. So the picture that Jesus paints here is of someone who's putting their hope and trust in the temporary things of this world in order to save them and to protect their lives. But the things of this world are passing away. That's what John says in 1 John 2, 17. He says, and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. That is what we have here. You know, the history of the world is filled with men and women who have tried to put their trust in the things of this world. They have tried to amass all kinds of things to avoid death. And they are all batting zero. None of them have been successful. Every one of them has died. Every one. Despite everything they did, in order to save their lives, 
They lost them. But contrast that with Jesus' promise. He said, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The true disciple who puts the entirety of his or her trust in the Savior will never be disappointed because his or her life will ultimately be saved. And I don't mean an eschatological sense, something way off in the future only. I mean it will be saved in the present. The person who puts their trust and faith in Jesus and follows him totally is, is the person who lives life in the fullest sense of the meaning in this world. It is the life that is spent in pursuit of the highest and greatest treasure there is, Jesus. That is that kind of life. And it's that kind of life that will have an eternal impact on those with whom they come into contact but it is that life that will also be saved in the future when Jesus returns in power and glory and he comes to this world. It is the person who has laid down their life, who has denied themselves and taken up their cross and followed Jesus, who will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into the joy of your master. That is what awaits the disciple. That is precisely why the martyred missionary Jim Elliot could say, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You see, Jim Elliot understood the emptiness of worldliness. He forsook all the world had to offer in order to go to the mission field in Ecuador in the mid-1950s in order to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to an unreached people group. And when he did, he died at their hands. They killed him. But he did not hold on to this life. He did not grasp it and try to hold on to it with everything he had. He was willing to pour it out for Christ, and he understood what Jesus said whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And Jesus continues by pointing out just how empty this world is in verses 25 and 26. Read again with me. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. You see, Jesus understood better than anyone how much is at stake with this dichotomy that he presents between following him and following the world. In these two verses, he presents the contrast in two ways. First, he says there's a contrast between loss and gain. And once again, this appears to be a paradox by the world's standards. You know, many have contemplated following Christ. Maybe they've even stepped onto the path for a little while and, and they followed him for a ways down the road until such a time as something else became more valuable, more profitable. You know, a lot of people today don't make commitments. They don't if you invite them to come to your home for dinner or something like that, they say, well, I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. If nothing better comes along, then I'll show up. You see, that's how people treat Christ, too. Yeah, Christ sounds good as long as nothing better comes along. But then the world presents fool's gold. It presents counterfeits that seem to be more valuable. And so maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's a sin that you have that gives you such tremendous pleasure. I love doing that sin. And Jesus says, don't. And I'm like, well, it was a good walking with you for a while, but I'm going to depart from this path because the cost is just too high. The world says you can have it all, but that's a lie. Jesus makes it clear, even if you were able to gain the whole world, and let me put it to you this way, no one ever has. 
Consider the greatest world leader who has ever existed on the stage of history. Even they were not able to gain the whole world, although they tried. But even if you were able to, and as a result of pursuing the world and gaining all that it had to offer, you forfeited your soul, you have lost everything. Because the things of this world, as we have already seen, are passing away. You don't need me to tell you that. You can be a secular materialist and understand that because the secular world says everything's breaking down. It's the law of entropy. Everything is falling apart. It's all going to dissolve. Now, it may be billions of years from their perspective, but that's what's happening. We say the same thing. We just say it's going to happen a little bit quicker and it's going to happen a lot more suddenly than what they think. You see, our souls are made for eternity. Not, not this. Our souls are made for eternity. That means we are always going to exist going forward. Going forward. The only question is, in what state are we going to exist? And here, there are only two states. There's hell, and there's heaven. That's it. There's no in-between. There's no, well, I didn't get into heaven, but I'm not bad enough for hell, and you know, I'm just going to float around. No, 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 no. The only way we get into heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ. There is one way. One. The way to hell is broad. It includes putting your trust and your hope and your faith in Anything other than Jesus. Anything. And so that's the first contrast, loss and gain. The second is shame and glory. You see, there are many who claim to be followers of Jesus, and yet they're ashamed to actually be identified with him. They deny his teachings. They attempt to transform him and recreate him into some bland, unoffensive, milquetoast teacher who's all hippie and, you know, fully accepting of everybody and everything. Just come on, I'll, I'll take you however you are. That is not Jesus that Jesus never confronts our sinfulness. He never calls us to holiness. And he is an idol. He is a made-up Jesus. Because when the world celebrates its sin, those who call, themselves Jesus, uh, who call themselves Christians, who are ashamed of Jesus and his words, they're noticeably silent. They don't take a stand. They don't call it out in love. Or worse, they reject what Jesus actually said. Well, he was just a product of his times. Well, that was then. Well, we're so much more advanced now. Brothers and sisters, if that's you, you need to hear this dire warning from the words of our Lord. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. In other words, if we refuse to claim him now, he will not claim us when he comes into the fullness of his glory. That's a dire warning. If we are so ashamed of him now that we will not bear any dishonor or discomfort and certainly not death on his account, then we can have no expectation of sharing in his glory when he comes to establish his rule for all eternity. It is the expectancy of that kingdom that's behind what Jesus says here in the last verse of our passage this morning. He says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What does he mean here? What's, what's he talking about? And how does that apply to us living as his disciples? Well, there is some debate over what Jesus meant here exactly. But I think when we understand that Jesus inaugurated his kingdom during his first advent, when he came in flesh. I think we have a clearer picture of what he means here. 
In Mark 10, 45, Jesus tells us explicitly why he came. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to serve us by laying down his life and dying for us. And just as we saw at the beginning, God's plan of redemption meant that Jesus would take on flesh and become like us in every way except sin. He lived that perfect life so he could go to the cross and pay the penalty for us. And with his death and resurrection, and then with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, after his ascension, we have the inauguration of his kingdom here on earth. It is, it is amazing what we see. The kingdom of God is going forward. And we who are his disciples have been called to live in that kingdom. And also in this worldly kingdom. We live in two kingdoms. But we're citizens of the heavenly kingdom first and foremost. We see this tension. It's the already and not yet. The kingdom of God has been inaugurated, but it's not fully understood. It's not fully consummated. You see, people are being saved every day, and they're putting their faith in Jesus. The gospel is going forth to the uttermost parts of the earth, to the darkest regions of the earth in sin. And yet, the earth still has the domain of darkness. It is still under the rule of the prince of the power of this air, our enemy, Satan. We see the sin and pain and death all around us. We see broken relationships and broken lives and broken world systems. But we also see the glory of Christ's church as she stands firm and unashamed of the gospel. Just like Luther said, that little word still abideth. No thanks to the powers of this world. Okay, they're not helping. But that doesn't matter because nothing can overcome the church. So Jesus' disciples continued to deny themselves, to pick up their crosses and follow him, even to the point of death, because they know the certainty of the consummation of his kingdom. The kingdom's here, and the kingdom will be consummated. It will be made complete when he comes at his second advent. In the first, he came as the babe in the manger, and we're approaching that season, aren't we? We're approaching that season of Advent and Christmas when we celebrate Jesus' first Advent, and we do so longing and looking forward to his second Advent, when he will come not as a little babe in the manger, but as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord but if you wait for that day to do so, that confession will have no saving power. It will be an acknowledgement of what exists. It will only be saving for those who were his disciples. It will only be them who enter into his kingdom. So this morning, I must tell you, do not waste your lives following the things of this world. Do not waste your lives putting your trust and hope in the things that are passing away. Do not be ashamed of Jesus and do not cheapen his grace by making it into something it is not. You've heard me speak of Dietrich Bonhoeffer before. I think it's wise to remember his words here. The German pastor, he led the confessing church during the time of the Nazis. This was a man who stood against some of the greatest evil we have seen on this earth. And in a book that he wrote called The Cost of Discipleship, he contrasted what he called cheap grace with costly grace. Cheap grace was being proclaimed by all those who were ashamed of Jesus, who were willing to go with the powers of this world. Costly grace was something else. Listen to what he said. He said, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Then he goes on to tell you what costly grace is. 
Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of a great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it cost a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. This morning, it is only by that costly grace that we're able to live this life of self-denial. It is only by the grace that God has given us through the through the work of Jesus Christ that allows us to live out this life of self-denial, bearing the cross and following him. And it is that costly grace that is available to you today, to all who would come to him in faith. And Jesus has invited you, if you would come after him, I am here to tell you on the authority of scripture that all who come to Jesus in faith, he will not turn away. And he will not forsake. So today, as long as it is called today, take up your cross, lay down your life, and follow Jesus in the power of that grace. Will you pray with me? Lord, your grace is amazing. We cannot say that enough. We could not sing it enough. And through all eternity, we will praise your holy name for the grace that you have given us in Jesus. Lord, in this day, we thank you for the grace you have given us. We thank you that you have called us to lay down our lives, to lay down our self-interest, to lay down the desires of our sinful flesh, to put those things to death every day and to follow you. I'm reminded that you told us to take your yoke for it is light and easy. Lord, let us cast off the yoke of sin and death and take the yoke of life the yoke that you have won for us the one that you have given to us so freely father i pray this morning that if there is anyone here who has not been following you who's been ashamed of you and unwilling to stand by what you have proclaimed all of it. And Lord, I pray that they would repent and turn away and turn to you. And Lord, for those who, who have never followed you, who have never accepted your gift of salvation in faith, that today would be that day. Lord, as we prepare to come to the table, where we remember that sacrifice. I pray that we take time to examine our hearts, to confess the sin that is there, and to receive your forgiveness 
the pardon full and free that comes in Christ. And Lord, that we would remember his sacrifice anew this morning and that it would nourish our souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.